This is a lecture from Open Tuition. To benefit from the lecture, you should download the free lecture notes from OpenTuition.com. The chapter itself is headed up divisional performance measurement, but we're now going to look at economic value added, which can be used on divisions, but equally is a measure that can be used on a single company. But it seems sensible to put it in this chapter because, as you'll see, it is a similar idea to um, the way we calculated residual income. And so um, it's paragraph or section nine of the lecture notes. And you'll see the um, second sentence. It's defined as the net operating profit after tax less. Uh, the weighted average cost of capital, the return we need for our long-term investors, times the value of capital employed. So I think you can immediately see the similarity to residual income. The profits less an interest charge effectively. The weighted average cost of capital applied to the value of capital employed in the statement of financial position. As you can see, it is trademarked. It's um, Stern Stewart and Co. that trademark came up with it and trademarked it. Uh, and so that's what it is. But we try and, uh, well, we adjust the figures, adjust the profit, adjust the capital employed to try and make them more realistic, to make the measure more realistic, to take account, as it says in the bold bit, to remove the effect of accounting entries and other non-cash estimates. We try and make it a bit more cash profit. Uh, because one problem with profits in any situation is they are distorted by accounting estimates such as oh, the way depreciation has been calculated. You know, with different ways of calculating, well that will affect obviously the, the, the reported profit year by year. And the main adjustments um, if you just run down the list, to profits, we adjust, we take out expenditure on building for the future, so things like research expenditure. Uh, they may reduce this year's profits, but, you know, they're there for a different reason. Take them out. Uh, Non-cash expenses, we don't go to great lengths doing cash estimates all the way through, but if there are any non-cash estimates, uh, add them back to get more of a cash profit. Uh, for the similar reasons that any provisions we've made. Uh, goodwill written off, similarly. Uh, depreciation. Now, although we'll never have to actually do this in the exam, um, depreciation, I explained, is a problem because there are different methods of calculating. Well, we should replace the depreciation that appears in the accounts with something called economic depreciation which is essentially the difference between um, what the asset is actually worth to us because of its future earnings at the beginning of the year and what it's worth to us at the end of the year because of its then future earnings. Now, you won't be asked to calculate economic depreciation, um, but if we do know it, well, we replace the existing depreciation with this economic depreciation. Um, interest on capital. Uh, interest on debt capital. It will have been charged in the profit statement, but we want the profits to see if the profits cover the cost of all our borrowing, so we need to add it back. Um, the state of financial position, when we're looking at the capital employed, the long term capital, which is shareholders' funds, share capital plus the reserves, uh, together with long term debt borrowing. Um, well, we need to adjust that, um, and in leases that haven't been capitalised, we need to bring them in to try and get a fair value of the assets employed. Um, uh, research, which we, we're now going to capitalise effectively, I've said it's an investment for the future, uh, goodwill written off provisions. So I learned the list, but we standardly make these adjustments. So let me show you how it works in exercise five. Well, there's a lot involved here. There's more than you could ever expect to deal with, but um, it should make the principle clear. 
Uh, extracts from the accounts of value are as follows. So for two years, 2014-2013, um, we've got the statements of profit or loss, the profit after tax, 88 in 2014-71 and 2013, uh, out of which there are dividends payable, so returned earnings increased by 59.47. Um, our statements of financial position, the total assets, 506 and 400. And so the total capital, long-term capital employed, shareholders funds, 380. Uh, long-term borrowing, 126, so a total of 506, uh, the previous year, 400. Uh, there's a whole list of information there. Let's run down quickly. Uh, number one, capital employed at the end of last year was 350. Two, uh, they did some non capitalized leases valued at 16 million. Uh, three and four, we know the cost of our debt borrowing and the cost of our equity borrowing. Number five, the target capital structure of the company intends overall to be 70% finance from equity and 30% from debt borrowing. Tax is 30%. Uh, economic depreciation, 64 and 72, these are equal to the depreciation that's been used for tax purposes and the depreciation charged in the income statements. So I said, whatever depreciation they've charged, we want to replace with this economic depreciation. But it tells us they have charged economic depreciation anyway. So we're not going to adjust. Uh, the interest payable, Six million, eight million. So that's the amount that will be within the income statements currently. Uh, there are non-cash expenses, twenty million and fifteen million. And research and development expenditure on a new project that was started in two thousand thirteen last year was written off uh, and written off uh, ten million in two thousand thirteen, eleven million in two thousand fourteen. All right, let's work through. First of all, let's adjust the profit. Uh, we start with the profit we've got. Now the profit after tax, 2014, 2013. 2014 it was 88, 2013 71. Um, when I was reading through the notes, if you look at note nine, there were some non-cash expenses, so I don't know what they were, but they were uh, being incorporated when those profits were arrived at. So we need to add them back to try and get more to a cash profit. So if those expenses weren't there, the profits would be higher by, what was it, 15 million in 2014 and 20 million in 2013. Also, when we were going through, I noticed, which note was it? Uh, 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 uh. Oh, note 10. Uh, there was some research and development. Well, in research and development, it's been written off 10 million and 11 million. Uh, this would normally be the case. But that's investment for the future. And whatever accounting rules may say, uh, we're effectively going to capitalise it as a result. We add it back. Uh, don't show it as an expense in arriving at the profit. So add it back. It was 10 million in 2013, 11 million in 2014. Uh, and finally, in arriving at the profits, um, interest will have been charged. Uh, standardly in the profit statement, um, you have your profit before interest and tax, you subtract the interest, you subtract the tax. But we want to add back any interest because we're looking at the profits available for all, to cover all the costs of long-term finance. And so add back the interest, but here just be careful you see the interest, does it tell us how much it was? Uh, 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 uh. Uh, yes, note eight. 
Um, if I do 2014 first, the interest was 8 million. Now that will have been charged in arriving at the profit. We want to get the profit before any interest. So, oh, but, but the profit would therefore be eight higher. But if the profit were higher, there'd be more tax payable. And so, although the profit itself, profit before tax, would be higher by eight, the tax would have been higher with higher profit. Uh, the tax would have been higher by the tax rate is thirty percent of thirty uh, percent, so the tax would have been thirty percent times eight. Uh, I hope that's making sense. Or if you want, it's higher by seventy percent of eight million. You see, if there hadn't been interest, there'd be no interest at all. Profit would have been higher. Tax would have been higher. So the final profit would have been higher by only here 70% of 8, 5.6. And similarly in 2013, uh, where was it again? The interest was 6 million. So profit 6 higher, but tax 30% of 6 higher. The net effect 70%.7 of 6, 42 so that gives us an adjusted profit for these purposes of 88, 15, 11, 5.6, 119.6 in 2014, and in 2013, 105.2. So we'll put it all together shortly, but there's the profit figure we're going to use, the adjusted profit. But before we do put it together, we need to also adjust the capital employed. Uh, 2014-2013. <coughs> Always we take the capital employed at the start of the year because we, uh, we make an assumption that it's whatever assets there were at the start of the year earned us the profit for the year. So what was the capital employed at the start of the year? At the start of 2014 um, it would have been the capital employed at the end of the previous year, 2014. And similarly, at the start of 2013, it would be the capital employed at the end of the previous year. No one tells us at the end of 2012 it was 350. So although we're going to adjust it, quite importantly, it's the opening capital employed we use. I've already said, but I'll repeat, because we assume that it's the assets that existed at the start of the year earned the profit for the year. Uh, we do need to make a few adjustments. Now, uh, first of all, non-cash expenses. In that surely, um, if we were removing them, it made the profit higher. And if the profit's higher, the retained earnings as part of shareholders' funds would be higher as well. But again, be careful. Because we're taking um, the capital employed at the start of the year, at 400 was the capital employed at the end of 2013, so it's whatever happened in 2013 will affect it. In 2013, there were non-cash expenses of 15 million, uh, sorry, 20 million, no, nine. If they hadn't have been there in 2013, the final retained earnings would have been higher, and therefore at the start of 2014, the opening capital employed would have been higher. 
Um, I know there were cash, non-cash expenses in, uh, have I got the right figure? Yeah, in 2014 there were non-cash expenses of 15 million, but they'll affect the capital employed at the end of 2014, which we're not interested in yet. There's no mention of the non-cash expenses in 2012, so 2013 is unaffected by, by this. Uh, research and development. At the moment, that doesn't appear on the statements of financial position. You wouldn't expect it to appear under financial accounting rules, but for the reasons we've already discussed, it's expenditure of the future. For these purposes, we're effectively capitalising it. So how much do we need to bring in? Uh, the research and development uh, is mentioned in note 10. Um, last year we wrote off 10 million and so last year the accounting profits would be lower by 10 million, retained earnings capital employed would be lower by 10 million at the end of the year. And again, because we're using opening uh, capital employed, which was it again? It's 10 million. So the, the 10 million through 2013 affects closing capital employed for 2013, opening for 2014. Again, there's no mention of any capital research in 2012, when in fact there wasn't any. It was started in 2013. Uh, and so that is irrelevant. Uh, finally, there was one other thing. Where was it? Note. Note two, we have non-capitalised leases. Oh, for whatever reason, they haven't been capitalised. For these purposes, make it more realistic, we will capitalise them. And it's 16 every year. And so, our adjusted capital employed in 2014 is 446. And in 2013, the opening capital employed 366. Now, I've talked so much, you've probably forgotten where we're going. We're going to take a, a, an approach very similar to residual income, in that the EVA, we say, is the profit for the year, okay, for 2014, 119.6, less interest applied to the capital at the start of the year of 446. Uh, well, the final bit before we can set it up is to work out what the overall cost is to the uh, company, the weighted average cost of capital. Um, it tells us in note four that the cost of equity borrowing is 17% this year, last year was 15%. Uh, the cost of our debt borrowing, uh, well, no, three tells us it was 9%, it's now 10%. But uh, debt borrowing, the interest does attract tax relief. And so, because we're saving tax on the interest, the net cost is actually lower. So, in 10, 2014, it was 10% before tax. There's tax somewhere at 30%. So, we're paying out 10%, we're saving 30% of it. The net cost after tax is 7%. And similarly in 2013, 9% interest, but because we save tax on the interest payments, the net cost is 6.3%. And so the weighted average in each of the two years, um, our target uh, overall is to have 70% equity and 30% debt. So in 2014, 70% is costing 17, 30% of our money is costing 7, 
And so an overall weighted average of, I think, 14%. Whereas in 2013, 70% is costing 15% from equity. There's 30% from debt, which is costing 6.3%. And so the overall, the weighted average cost in 2013, I get to be 12.39. Now I said there was a lot in this question, far more than you'd have to do in the exam. It's better doing too much than too little. Now we can actually do the EVA. We've got it just as we did with residual income. We take our profit, albeit after all this adjusting. So the profits were 119.6 and 105.2. Uh, we subtract an interest charge effectively. It's the weighted average cost of capital times the adjusted capital employed. So for 2014, the weighted average was 14%. The capital employed was 446. And so we subtract 62.44. Uh, and for 2013, the interest is 12.39%. The opening capital employed was 366. And so the interest to be subtracted is 45.35. Let me just check that 12.39 times 366. 45.35, yeah. Which leaves us with an economic value added fifty seven point one six in two thousand fourteen in two thousand thirteen fifty nine point eight five. So there we are for the arithmetic, and just hopefully to make sense of the logic behind all this, you see we're saying that our investors need that much to keep them happy. You know, they need in 2014 a 14% return on their capital. They need 62.44, whereas last year they needed 45.35. They were only wanting 12% return on their capital and there was only 366 capital. So those amounts are the amounts they need to keep them happy. Uh, if the company is actually earning more than that, the company is growing, it's giving them extra value. If it's earning less than that, then of course we've got problems. And so in both cases, there is this bonus over and above what they need. And the bigger the excess, the better. So, in fact, the company's gone slightly worse this year. Oh, so there we are. I'm not going to talk any more. On uh, uh, the next page, potential problems of economic value added. But I think either I've mentioned this we're going through or a similar problems to return uh, to residual income. Um, you should have no problem reading those four things yourself.